the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport, then this is the podcast for you. Today, I'm with Dr. Sam Winter and Professor John Dickinson, and we're here to talk about respiratory physiology. We discuss the mechanisms of breathing and how even elite athletes may not be breathing efficiently. We discuss asthma and its high prevalence in elite athletes before finally discussing how the OEP system is being used to detect dysfunctional breathing to help improve performance. Hi Sam, hi John, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Hi. Hi. And to get us started, would you guys just be able to give us a brief introduction to your background, starting with yourself, Sam? Sure. Um, So my name's Sam Winter. Um, uh, I'm at Loughborough University and uh, I'm a biomechanist by training. Um, And I tend to work in sort of health applications of biomechanics, although it often is the case that actually you start in a particular area and and the things that you learn can apply to other areas as well. So it tends to work its way back to sport. Um, uh, What I've been working on most recently is basically a motion capture system, which can track uh, the chest wall during breathing um, and detect certain things about the way that we breathe and breathing patterns and how those differ between different groups. Um, And that's how I've um, met John and worked with him. Good segue into John. So John, introduce yourself, please. Yeah. uh, My name's John Dickinson. Uh, I'm a professor at the uh, University of Kent. Um, I've been dealing with um, elite athletes for around about 20 years now, helping them overcome various respiratory problems. Um, By training, I'm a a sports scientist. Um, I I probably describe myself as an exercise, an applied exercise respiratory physiologist. Um, But a little bit of, but I kind of verge a little bit across into sports medicine and into exercise respiratory physiology um supporting athletes getting objective testing done uh, and also helping them overcome maybe um, respiratory problems that aren't always easily answered by simply calling an athlete uh, asthmatic brilliant so i'm hoping by the end of this podcast all our listeners will get to understand breathing and everything that we need to know about it especially for some athletes as well yeah so to get us started will you guys just be able to explain to us a look, the basics of breathing and breathing technique yeah I, I'll, I'll kick off with that if you want sam um well this is probably the crux of the um the, the, the podcast is if you actually to ask us what is good breathing technique that objectively it's very difficult to actually to, to say that but what we can what we know is obviously you have respiratory muscles so we all probably know the diaphragm and we also have muscles in between our ribs called the intercostal muscles and what we need is actually those muscles to contract some of the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles to contract to actually move our rib cage and what happens is by moving that rib cage it lowers the pressure inside of the lungs that allows air to come in and then we, we supply our lungs with air that's um, high, it's high in oxygen, so 21% oxygen. And obviously we can then exchange gas in the alveoli, so the bottom of the lung. And then we breathe out, so we get a contraction of the rib cage, relax, relaxation of the diaphragm, a little bit of contraction of the internal intercostal muscles, and we breathe out. Now, what is a good method of breathing um, is debatable. And you might hear, we touched on it a little bit when we were doing the pre-record for this, we are talking about belly breathing versus chest breathing. What we actually think is what we need is the lower rib cage should be moving during shallow kind of rested breathing. And then the deeper we breathe, the more the rib cage we move. Now, when you hear belly breathing, what's actually happening is the lower rib cage so the floating ribs that kind of go kind of down the side of your abdomen they're the part that's moving so they're the, they're the part that's moving and that's where you see the belly breathing but actually it's not your belly actually pushing out it's your lower rib cage moving that actually causes a rise in the abdomen and so that's where we can people refer to belly breathing it's not actually that it's just lower rib cage movement and then the deeper you breathe the more rib cage you move and effectively that's kind of the crux of, of a good breathing pattern and what you want to try and avoid is kind of shallow breathing up in your upper chest so we see a lot of dysfunctional breathers a lot of hyperventilators they use a lot of shoulder breathing breathing very high up in their breath and that results in a higher breathing frequency and can result in compromising oxygen transfer into into the blood and then has knock-on effects from there so just when you ex- when you talk about oxygen transfer into the blood, can you just brief- briefly explain how that happens and-, and how it's restricted from this shallow breathing? 
Yeah, so w w obviously when we're breathing, we, w we want to obviously breathe to v what we call ventilate the airway. So that's obviously going to mean the w w why we want to do that is because obviously our body needs oxygen to, to, to produce energy, to help produce our energy aerobically. So when we take a big, big deep breath in, blood coming into the lungs is what we call deoxygenated. So it's gone through the body, it's come back to the heart and it gets pumped to the lungs to go and collect more oxygen and get rid of CO uh, carbon dioxide. And so as the blood's passing over the lungs, you, it's got relatively low oxygen in, in the blood and relatively high oxygen inside the lungs in the alveoli. And at that point, it's simply oxygen is going to move down a diffusion gradient. So you've got high, grade, high, ox high oxygen concentration in the alveoli, low oxygen concentration in the blood. Simply, the, bl the oxygen is going to um, diffuse across the alveoli wall, across the capillary wall, into the blood. It gets caught by a, um, a red blood cell. And, and the opposite happens to CO2. So CO2 is high concentration in the blood as it enters the lung and low concentration of CO2 in the lung. And so CO2 moves the other way. And then we kind of get what we call a gas transfer. So when you breathe out, you breathe out, out the CO2 that is kind of byproduct of energy production and your, and your blood leaves the lung what we get high in oxygen concentration. So then it can be um, distributed around the body for aerobic um, energy um, uh, production. Take, taking me back to my sports science days there. So very, very well explained. And I'm sure we now have got the basics of breathing. I know from some of your guys' research that you mentioned things like uh, body size, age, gender, all may affect breathing. Could you touch upon a few of those for us and tell us how that might affect breathing? Yeah, again, long term, I don't think, um, I mean, we don't, I don't think it's been studied enough to really get a good gauge of kind of how breathing patterns might change through through, through um, ageing or, or, or by gender. I don't think we can probably go there too much. What we do know, though, is that your lung function tends to decrease over time. So once you become a fully grown adult from the age of around about 25, 30, you'll see a steady progressive loss in lung function over time when we say loss in lung function what we mean is the total amount of air that you can expire from your lungs might drop a little bit and also the speed that the air comes out of your lungs might drop a little bit and it's difficult to say how fast it will go but it will depend on the individual it can be genetic um and it can also depend whether you've got airway diseases as well and also the exposure to pollutants or whether you smoke or whether you live in a smoking household the greater exposure to pollutants or smoke will potentially increase the risk of a faster decline in lung function brilliant and i think we're going to talk later on potentially about covid and potentially about kind of obesity and, and, and effects like that but i think for now should we have a look at the athlete side of things mm -hmm. yep so obviously breathing is important for athletes um you know vo2 maxes and, and this kind of thing are very important but i know we're going to touch upon athletes and asthma so do you want to just get us started really on on the effects of asthma and um salbutanol use among athletes and why it's fairly prevalent from some of your guys research yeah i mean we, again um it's, it might be surprising to hear that um athletes are are more susceptible to to the um, airway disease um such as asthma so asthma is the most common chronic um disease that athletes athletes um, report um respiratory symptoms themselves are the most frequently reported at, at um major olympic uh, major, major championships like like olympic games so their respiratory problems just generally are, are quite common among athletes when we look at asthma specifically um the general population prevalence of asthma is around about nine percent in the uk and um, when we look at the british olympic team so some of my early research part of my phd we demonstrated 21 percent of the british olympic team have an asthmatic condition um, and what we see actually is a range in terms of prevalence across sports so some sports um, are around about the nine percent prevalence so a sport like boxing for example is about eight percent prevalence from from some of the research that we produced but then you can that that the risk of an athlete experiencing asthma increases when the sport is high ventilation, it's sustained high ventilation, and or it takes place in a um, what kind of an asthmogenic environment. An asthmogenic environment might be polluted, might be cold, dry air. And when we see that the combination of high ventilation in an asthmogenic environment, we see much higher prevalences than the general population. To give a few examples, we've got things like elite cycling prevalences around about 40%. Elite swimming uh, prevalence, we've reported it around about ju just under 70% uh, for the elite uh, British swimming team. So you can see, well, not say ridiculous, but very high uh, prevalences 
in in some sports and maybe not so much in other sports and a lot of that's down to um not just the athletes going into it their genetic makeup a lot of it is caused from the environment and the conditions of the sport they're being asked to put their bodies through isn't it true that the um prevalence in the general population is round about nine percent so round about the level of the um boxers that you were that you mentioned so yeah. just to put it in perspective if you're talking about rates of kind of you know 40 to 70 percent that's that's a lot lot higher than you expect to find in the general population yeah yeah and it's not just British athletes, that's been also re- re- reported. Um, so we see similar problems with uh, cross-country skiers in Scandinavian countries. It's a prevalence around about 50% in those types of sports um, and about 35% in ice skaters. So, it's, it's all, you know, it's not just the UK data. It's quite, quite commonly known around the world that athletes are more susceptible to asthma. What we also know is that asthma is not the only breathing problem af- athletes can face. So we know that they can, they can experience various other problems. Um, just to give you some data from a very recent study that has been published for, um, that I was involved with, with from the English Institute of Sport, where they, they looked at 122 elite athletes. 80% of those athletes reported at least one respiratory health issue. And those respiratory health issues, um, half of them were from a nasal issue. Around about 35% were either allergy or a laryngeal problem, so an upper airway issue or an allergic issue. 22% of them were asthmatic issues, and 22% of them were were a condition called dysfunctional breathing, which is kind of an umbrella term for, for not maybe having the appropriate breath. So quite quite a range of issues that athletes can face. The second thing is that 60% of the athletes that had a respiratory issue also had another respiratory issue. So what that kind of says is what just because maybe you pick up asthma or you pick up a nasal issue, that doesn't mean that that is the only problem the athlete might might face. And so what we've what we're really promoting when we work with athletes, and this should really be, it doesn't have to be athletes, it should be with everybody really. There should be a systematic assessment for respiratory health rather than simply just an investigation for one aspect of respiratory health. And I think that would help um, one, make sure that athletes themselves are, are being cared for appropriately. But if you think about uh, holistically um, for people that maybe aren't elite athletes, it would mean that if they ever get out of breath, for example, someone might have a diagnosis of asthma. It might mean when they start exercising, they start thinking, well, I'm out of breath, so it's got to be, got to be my asthma. And then some people might choose not to take part in physical activity because of their asthma, when actually their asthma might be well controlled and they might have a dysfunctional breathing pattern as well as their asthma. If they worked on their breathing pattern, then they may well be able to take part in sport and enjoy sport without any 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 problems at all. So that holistic process and managing the patient holistically from a respiratory health point of view rather than picking out individual uh, conditions is really important. That's brilliant. And I think yeah. we're going to touch upon the, the dysfunctional breathing and, and potential dysfunctional breathing training um, later on. So we'll, we'll re-pick up on that shortly. So in terms of, you mentioned asthma, in terms of what many people do then for asthma is they'll take their inhaler. Um, and obviously that's potentially what's going to help help them with, with their yeah. breathing. So can you just explain to us what, in, what the inhaler is and what it does and, and then why so many athletes you know, would be taking it? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, let me say, it, it, what, I think what, what's interesting there, you, you kind of said the inhaler and actually there's lots of inhalers. <laughs> so there's lots of colours. I'm sure people with asthma will, will be aware of the various colours. And basically there's, there's two kind of mainstays of, of therapy. One's um, kind of, um, I guess you refer to as emergency, emergency therapy, reactive therapy. And that's maybe the what we're most familiar thinking about asthma is the blue inhaler. So that's and in that blue inhaler is a, a drug called sabutamol, a sh- and it's a short acting beta 2 agonist. Um, what that therapy does, so the blue, the blue inhalers and also the green inhalers work for a, do a similar thing, but over a longer period of time. When you inhale them into your lungs, what they do is they basically relax the smooth muscle around the airway. So when, when an individual experiences asthma, what happens is there's an inflammatory response to the asthma, to the, um, to the trigger, and that could be pollution, could be dry air, etc. Um, there's an inflammatory response, and that inflammatory response then causes the smooth muscle to constrict around the airway, which then makes it harder for the individual to breathe air out. So the, the blue inhaler, the, the sabutamol, when you inhale it into your lungs, it relaxes the smooth muscle, so it opens up the airway, and it works really quickly. So once an individual inhales it, 
within 30 seconds to a minute, they start to feel that their airways are, are responding and the ma- kind of the, the, the maximum dilation happens around about 10 to 15 minutes after that, after that inhalation. Now, what the, the, the issue with that is that that doesn't actually kind of solve the root cause of the problem. It doesn't deal with the inflammation. So what individuals with asthma should be doing is using a what's called an inhaled corticosteroid on, on a regular basis. The inhaled corticosteroid is usually a brown inhaler. Or you can get in it as a combination with with uh, with a long acting beta two agonist. It, it may be a purple inhaler. You, you might see people use, um, and that basically the inhaled corticosteroid is, is the anti-inflammatory part. It dampens down the inflammatory uh, response to the asp- to the asthmogenic trigger going into the into the lungs. And if you dampen down the inflammation, you dampen down the potential severity of the of the of the asthma when when the lungs come in touch with that asthma, asthma with the with the trigger. But also you also reduce the chances of the lung undergoing what we call airway remodeling. And so the inflammation can cause what we call epithelial damage. So basically the the cells in the lung, the airway, sort of the airway lining can get damaged from too much inflammation. And over time, what happens, you can get almost permanent thickening of the wall. And so what we want to try and avoid that, so we want to avoid this airway remodeling. Um, So using things like inhaled corticosteroids on a daily basis is what people with asthma should be doing. One of the reasons why they don't is because partly because they're a little bit nervous about taking steroids over a long period of time. Um, And also the, the, the inhaled corticosteroids takes around about two weeks to build up into your system. To be effective and so if you give an individual a brown inhaler and a blue inhaler when they feel symptomatic their blue inhaler works great the brown inhaler doesn't seem to do anything so they tend to not not commit to it so it's about education of of the uh, um, to individuals when you give them the inhalers to make sure they're using the inhalers correctly to make sure they get they're optimizing their, their prevention not just when not just on that acute time but also long-term long-term management of it so and alongside those two main inhalers there are other inhalers as well <laughs> so there's lots of all the different add-on therapies that individuals might get um alongside that but the two main main parts are the inhaled corticosteroids and um the inhaled beta 2 agonists which are kind of your, your blue inhalers and, and as you touched upon there obviously you've already mentioned that a lot of athletes are asthmatic um and obviously they're going to be using you know various types of inhalers and steroids and obviously this potentially has problems regarding wada and and doping yeah so can you just elaborate we, we had a conversation earlier could you just elaborate a little bit on on the potential problems that some of these athletes have i think you mentioned swimming and cycling in particular earlier yeah well, well i mean it's, it's, it, it, i guess the water rules are, are relevant for all athletes um I think maybe there's been some high profile issues with, with certain certain athletes in certain sports recently in the in the papers and things, which probably why 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 those two sports kind of kind of cropped up. Um, now, in terms of the WADA rules, um, inhaled corticosteroids aren't 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 banned at all. So athletes can use the brown inhalers um, as, as I guess theoretically as much as they like, but they should be using it within what what's been prescribed to them. Um, so they can use inhaled corticosteroids without without any any issue at all. The things like inhaled salbutamol, so the blue inhaler, athletes are allowed to take up to uh, eight puffs, so 800 micrograms of salbutamol in a 12-hour period. Um, And again, they don't, to use that medication like in that way, they don't have to submit any documentation. They just have to declare if they're actually um, having a drugs test at the time, they just have to declare they've taken it and how much they've taken, but they don't have to get a special certificate or anything like that. Um, what when it and and what we know is that medication at that level, um, there's no evidence at the moment to say it's, it improves um, whether it improves um, endurance performance, strength performance um, on acute or a long term basis. There's no evidence to suggest that's the case. In fact, you could almost argue it's counterproductive, especially the taking too much beta two agonists might actually cause increases in heart rate and things. So for endurance performance, it almost has the opposite effect. Um, but there are questions, though, if you start to take higher doses, um, potentially higher doses of beta 2 agonists can cause it doesn't actually actually affect endurance performance. It's more because it, then you start to get sort of more general um, circulation of beta 2 agonists. And what that can do if you take really high doses is it can improve anaerobic performance so it can improve uh, power and strength performance 
Um, and so higher doses of beta agonists inhaled forms are, are, aren't allowed. And also oral forms of either inhale, uh, of either, either sub, um, beta agonist or corticosteroid aren't allowed. Um, so it's kind of a bit of a gray zone. What, what, I, what I would say is that elite athletes using medication as it's prescribed, they aren't cheating. And there's no evidence for that to be a performance enhancer. What the problem is, is when athletes start taking, start accessing what we call therapeutic use exemption. So they get permission to use kind of otherwise banned substances for, for a condition. And then it becomes a little bit of a gray zone as to whether athletes can manipulate the TUE system to be able to use a bit of a stronger medication um, to, to get the performance enhancement that they would, wouldn't otherwise get from sort of um, less le, um, le, sort of low, lower level drugs like like inhaled like inhaled forms uh, of asthma therapy. Um, and for an example, one example of that is is a drug called tubutyly, which is similar to sabutamol, so it's a short acting beta agonist. And that drug is an inhaled drug, um, and it can be an oral drug. Now, the reason why the inhaled form and the oral form are both banned is because you can't differentiate between an inhaled dose and an oral dose. But an athlete could um, dem- present evidence could present evidence where that their subutyl inhaler, for whatever reason, isn't effective for them, but tubutylene is. And so therefore they could get therapeutic use exemption to use a tubutylene inhaler rather than a subutyl inhaler. However, once they've got that TUE for tubutylene, it kind of opens the door a little bit to for the unscrupulous athlete to go, you know what, I can probably get away with having a big, a big, a big dose of oral tubutylene here and and, and benefit from the from the from the um, performance um, so the power the strength and power performance. It's the same thing for uh, oral corticosteroids. So oral corticosteroids is a drug called prednisolone, which is quite quite often given to very severe um, asthma, um, asthmatics if they are on the verge of being hospitalised or, or are hospitalised. And so it's usually only given to asthmatics in in quite quite severe situations and it's only given for a week or two weeks so it's not usually you wouldn't expect it to be given to an athlete that's about to compete in a high at a world championship event however there are occasions when athletes have been um so I kind of reported their asthma, their asthma symptoms are significantly bad at, at the time, and the t- the, their their doctor has has applied for a, a TUE for prednisolone. Um, now prednisolone is actually allowed to be used outside of competition. So with it outside of two weeks before competition, athletes can use prednisolone um, without a TUE. But within two weeks, they need they need a TUE for it. Um, and prednisolone potentially is it, it is it, it's a strong corticosteroid. It's a strong anti-inflammatory. Um, drug so potentially it might if an athlete's using it during competition they might benefit from the anti-inflammatory effects of the drug might get faster recovery times might get um, reduction in perception of fatigue levels and things like that so potentially it might improve their performance but if the individual really has asthma and really 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 um, needs the prednisolone you probably got a question: Should they be on the starting lineup for a for a world championship competition anyway? Because their body probably isn't in, in a very fit state to compete. So th- this this becomes lesser. It's more the use of the asthma and asthma therapy is probably more of a philosophical debate that needs to happen with with some 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 medics and probably needs to have a some lot big long debates because. I'm going on a little bit here, but it's quite a bit of a point. Hopefully, people haven't seen me gone to sleep. But the, um, the one of the issues is that, for example, we had a lot of it, kind of furore around um, Bradley Wiggins in the press about getting a TUE for, and it wasn't actually a, an asthma therapy; it was an allergy therapy. He got a TUE for, and what that has potentially had a, had a knock-on effect is some athletes have gone, well, I don't want a TUE now because if I, you know, if I get found out that I've used a TUE, I'm going to get put, you know, and Bradley didn't cheat. We have to remember that he didn't cheat because it was, a, the TUE was given and he get used it under the, under the license of, of, of the certificate. But obviously within the press, ethically, that was kind of questioned whether that's ethically right to, 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 to be doing that. And athletes might decide they don't want a TUE because they don't want to be tarnished with that brush of what's ethically right for an athlete to do. Now, if they re, re, decide they don't want that, that stronger medicine when actually they need it from a health point of view they might decide well i'll just i'll just rely on taking my sabutamol to get me through 
get me through the um, the competition or whatever. Now, the problem with that is that an athlete's only allowed to take 800 micrograms of salbutamol. So they might be at risk of taking too many doses of that. And what we've seen is that if they take too many doses of that, they can be an elevation of salbutamol concentration in their urine. And then they give a positive or they give an elevated urine concentration. So that becomes an adverse analytic finding. They've got to explain why that's in their system. Um, so there's also kind of knock-on effects and, and little nuances around athletes use, using asthma therapy. What I always try and go back to, though, is an athlete is well-controlled, well-medicated, and, 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 and well-managed. They shouldn't really be needing to go anywhere near the TUEs. And if they do, it's probably some severe exacerbation. And if they do need to go so many of the two years are on competition, then there's got to be some serious questions whether that athlete should be competing at that particular time. Um, but then, you know, that's a medical decision between between the medic and, and the athlete themselves. So that's a really good insight into kind of all sides of the story there, and especially the piece on on, you know, athletes now not wanting to take these two UEs because they might be seen as drugs cheats and actually it might affect their health. That's a really interesting um, you know, way of putting that across. Um, you did mention kind of dysfunctional breathing and asthma diagnosis. Can, can asthma be misdiagnosed? Because you mentioned there was numerous factors that could affect respiratory um, breathing rates and things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, is the answer to that. Asthma can be misdiagnosed, um, it, and a lot of the time, the re- and one of the reasons for that is because there's not one perfect test for asthma, whether that be um, sort of asthma in the general population or af- asthma within within an athletic population. There are some tests, and, and ha- using a, a combination of tests do get you a more definitive answer. But it, it part of the re- part of the reason why you get misdiagnosis is is, is the knowledge of the me- of the medic treating the individual, the accessibility to the irrelevant um, uh, tests as, as well. And so what we know is if we, for example, if, if an athlete just, just reports to, to their, to their um, GP, say, when I exercise, I get short of breath, find it really difficult to breathe and wheezing a little bit when I'm exercising. So they're all symptoms you might associate with asthma. We know if diagnosis alone is made on, on just symptoms, we, the diagnosis is wrong 50% of the time. So it's like flipping a coin. So just diagnosing um, asthma on symptoms is, is, isn't particularly helpful. We know in the general population, there's a misdiagnosis rate of asthma of about 33%. So in, in the general population, asthma diagnosis isn't being particularly well well carried out. And again, that might be a, a combination of um, accessibility to, to, to testing as well as much as it is about the tests themselves being, being not particularly uh, we, we, I guess the, the tests are good as long as they're interpreted correctly. But just for an example's sake, um, there's two there's two different types of, of asthma tests. One is a um, what we call a direct airway challenge, and and, that, and within that usually carried out in a hospital, it's called a methacholine challenge. And direct airway challenges they basically directly stimulate your your smooth muscle in your airway. So at a given um, concentration of methacholine, everybody's lung function. Will, will react to it and so therefore you get you'll get a tightening but there are cutoffs in terms of they, they kind of say a, cer- a certain concentration um below below that is is, is a positive test and and likely um to be um well it may mean the individual has asthma but a positive test to that doesn't confirm asthma but a negative test rules out asthma so you can't confirm it but you can rule it out the other way around of doing it is to maybe, for example, with an athlete, you might do an exercise challenge. So you might say, well, let's let measure their lung function and let's tr- try and trigger off the asthma. So we then ask the individual to um, go and do some some sort of hard exercise that might bring on their symptoms or or um, might replicate kind of their hardest piece of training or hardest part of their, their sport. And we basically ask them to do that real, real high intense piece of activity for maybe 10 minutes. We measure their lung function before they start and measure it after they finish. And what we're looking for is a drop off in their lung function after they finish and they might give you a negative test and the flip side it basically an indirect dairy challenge works in a different way so if you're positive to the indirect dairy challenge it, it, it kind of confirms the asthma or the, or the exercise induced asthma but if you're negative to it it doesn't rule it out so you kind of have these kind of uh, sort of nuances and 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 you need so it's a it needs skilled practitioners to be able to one yes we still need symptoms we still want to take a patient history to get a good idea of what the what's what the what the individuals kind of reporting but also need to understand the the strengths and weakness of the testing as well and so for an example to get a, a diagnosis of asthma you might need to do it in two or three different tests to get to get the evidence you need 
Um, we've got we within athletes, we've kind of developed quite a, a nice systematic um, respiratory health um, uh, overview that allows us to, to do that. And we use a quite a sensitive test. And again, this is a lovely a, lo- a lovely name of a test that we, we get, we'll get into another one in a little bit. But this one's called a Eucapnic Voluntary Hypernia Challenge. Um, so it's called an EVH challenge. And what that means is we basically sit instead of asking athletes to exercise, we basically ask them to breathe as if they were exercising, but we give them a massive dose of dry air and basically they breathe really hard for six minutes. And that test is really sensitive, um, but maybe it's overly sensitive because it's six minutes of breathing dry air at about an intensity that you'd be at maybe during a VO2 max test at the very end of a VO2 max test. So maybe an individual wouldn't breathe like that during, during, during exercise. But what it does is it tells us that individual potentially can experience the exercise induced asthma during competition. And so by being a little bit, um, sort of oversensitive with the test at least we're, we're picking up the ones that have, have a potential to go and from my experience of 20 years of doing the testing I've only ever had two or three individuals that give me a negative test to EVH but then when we've exercised them maybe during uh, the pollen season which may be their main, their main trigger they've given us a positive test so again it's not that one test itself isn't isn't perfect for everybody but it does give you a, a good 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 a good over, general overview of, of whether individuals like to have asthma or not. So, to answer your question short, yes, you can get misdiagnosed with asthma, uh, but and the reason for that is because there's not a, a one perfect test for it. And Sam, I'm aware you're sat on the sidelines with us there, so apologies for keeping you there for too long. Um, and I'm going to attempt to to name another test that you've been involved with and, and get it wrong. So. Can you explain to us the, the testing that you've been done? So I'm reading reading here. So the optoelectronic plethysmography. I've got that wrong again, haven't I? Go on, go on, Sam. Put me out of my misery. Yeah. Optoelectronic plethysmography. Plethysmography. Was that right? That's right. Yeah. There we go. It's a bit, bit better when I copy off you. So can you explain to us what that is and and, and how it helps with the diagnosis uh, diagnosis of asthma? Sure. So um, optoelectronic plethysmography, and we do have an acronym for it, so you can call it OEP instead, and (laughs) that's easier to say. Um, But this is basic, this is based on motion capture technology. So often during the sort of DVDs on the making of an animation film or whatever, you see these actors walking around with these kind of reflective markers on. Um, And we have similar systems in biomechanics. So we have these reflective markers. We've got um, lots of cameras around the room that can detect the the motion of this. Um, And in when we're doing respiratory testing, we have markers basically from your shoulders um, down to your pelvis. So um, just around your waist um, and then front, back and sides all around your chest um, in quite quite a high density grid of markers. Um, And as those move in and out as you breathe, basically that allows us to do everything that a kind of traditional lung function testing in terms of spirometry might allow us to do. So we can track things like the volume and the timing um, and the speed of expired air. But in addition to that, because we've got lots and lots of markers, we can actually track um, individual sections of the of the chest and how they move. Um, and we can compare the relative timing of these different sections um, and how much different sections are contributing to the overall breath volume so for example we've talked about belly breathing and chest breathing um you know we can detect if somebody's uh, using that section of their chest um or not and it turns out that this is a really good way to detect some of these dysfunctional breathing techniques because a dysfunctional breath is likely to happen when for example um these different sections of the chest aren't moving together so they're moving out of phase so you might move your upper chest before your abdomen or the other way round, or it can show up that perhaps you're not using as much of, of a certain part of your chest as, as a healthy person breathing normally would do. So, for example, there might be less motion at the shoulders or, or whatever. So that's basically what um, OEP is. Um, and actually, I, I was really surprised um, having when we started not knowing much about dysfunctional breathing. Um, but actually, 
the the things that we track show up the dysfunctional breathing really really well um, and it can give you a complete picture of what's going on and it it actually looks very different to what a healthy breath is and very different again to how asthmatic breathing looks so what exactly is it that you you've kind of picked out from your from your research how, how do you diagnose you know this this dysfunctional breathing and then how do you how do you retrain people to to breathe properly John, do you want to do you want to maybe talk about kind of what you see with athletes? Um, yeah, yeah. So again, this is I mean, this is this is some of the really for me, this has been the really exciting stuff that the collaboration between myself and Sam has really, really kind of kick started our understanding because prior to having the accessibility to do this testing of breathing pattern using OEP, a lot of it's been based on people like myself or, or, or respiratory uh, physios basically just watching people breathe and and basically trying to get an idea of the way they're moving their rib cage so what we i guess dysfunctional breathing like some say can happen in different ways so there's different types of dysfunctional breathing so i, I to kind of simplify i've tried to put it into kind of three categories the first one is simply a hyperventilation state where you where the movement isn't necessarily wrong but it's just too fast so you're basically breathing more than you need to breathe uh, per minute in terms of breath frequency and and the actual breath at each breath is probably a bit too small so you end up just breathing very shallow so it's a <laughs> sort of thing um another type is um where we, we expect that the lower rib cage and upper rib cage to kind of move together um in a in a nice um synchronized phase so as you're breathing in your abdomen and lower cage moves at the same time as your upper rib cage now what we see is so in some individuals they get what we call asynchronization so their lower rib cage and their abdomen move before their upper rib cage moves so we call that an asynchronic uh breathing pattern the other type that we see is uh, maybe an apical breathing pattern. So there's a lot of shoulder movement and a lot of locking in the upper rib cage. And so we don't see, even though we get a lot of shoulder movement, we don't actually see that much movement in the kind of the upper rib cage. And a lot of the movement happens in the lower rib cage. And the individuals just feel they can't can't get a full expansion in, the, in their rib cage. Now, all, all of those different types of dysfunctional breathing pattern can happen in isolation but sometimes you see a bit of a combination of hyperventilation with asynchrony or asynchrony but also with with apical breathing so a lot of shoulder movement as well so it's not that it's not that there's three different types and you you fit into one sometimes you kind of might be a bit of one and a bit of another one um and so the way that you go about working with an individual the key thing is that i found working with the individuals with with dysfunctional breathing patterns is videoing them and showing them what they're doing what's great about the oep is we've actually been able to develop a, a real-time feedback so if you educate the individual about what the figures and the graphs show that we can beam up from the oep we can show them what what that what that movement actually produces in terms of their their, their rib cage movement and also how much air they're breathing per breath and so once you actually tell the individual look you, you think you're breathing well and, and a lot of people when i first tell them you know what the reason why you can't get that get those get can't breathe very well when you're doing maybe repeated sprint um training or, anything, or something like that it's just simply because you're not breathing properly they look at you and go nah it can't be that can't be because i'm not breathing right can't be because my movement's not right because no you know you just breathe don't you you don't no one tells you no, no one teaches you how to breathe you just breathe but actually when you actually show them and you educate them about what should happen they go, oh, OK. And then they try, the, try, try. And, and we try and explain to them to get that lower rib cage movement, to get the synchronization together. Suddenly, when people do that, they, they it feels different. It's a bit like, you know, you, you know, you might, might have a might be a swimming, might be a swimming. And then your coach says, actually, I want your, your arm to go in a bit higher up or your elbow to point up. And it feels horrible to start off with. But actually, you 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 you, you change the breathing pattern, you 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 make the synchrony better you make the movement of the rib cage greater the individual can breathe more air per breath they actually feel it it feels brilliant for them because there's no there's no um sort of tension no tightness in their chest so it makes it we trying to make this break breathing effortless basically and if you're a really really efficient breather even though you're breathing hard it shouldn't feel that that's the that's the reason why you can't go any faster so we basically we, we educate the individual about how they're breathing and then to actually retrain them is a bit of a combination of various things. So part of it is breathing pattern training and actually simply just trying to get that moving pattern better. Part of it might be actually working on the posture. So we know postural positioning can 
can affect breathing patterns. So we might do a little bit of postural work. We also might might bring in some inspiratory muscle training to try and make the respiratory muscles a bit stronger. And that can also be used to promote a better breathing pattern. Um, we might do some anxiety um, sort of control. So we might bring in sports psychology into it because a lot of these individuals might just be a little bit anxious about breathing during high intensity training. They might have built up a little bit of an expectation about how they should be feeling with their breathing during high, during high intensity work. Um, and, and there might be other things we might bring in as well. So we have to look at it holistically. And some people, it's just the education. Other people, it's dealing with the anxiety. Some other people, they need a bit of everything. And how how quickly people can respond to that, again, it, is it, it's difficult to say. I've had some people where I've educated them and they've gone from not being able to run 30 seconds on a treadmill to doing a 30-minute run on a treadmill within a day. And it's literally just like the pennies drop and they go, oh, that's how you breathe and off they go. Other people have had... Um, take over a year year to crack it um, and we've and we've helped them and they overcome it and some of those individuals have, been, have gone on to be olympic champions so it, it, it's kind of how how long it takes depends on the individual depends on how quickly they can they can buy in and and and, and basically change their breathing pattern which you know just imagine someone coming up to you and saying you're not walking right you need to walk walk with your, you need, you need to plant your foot slightly differently it feels horrible to start off with and um, so to change these kind of ingrained movement patterns within the body can can take a little bit of time and a little bit of trust and during exercise it's probably the hardest time to change it because that's when there's the most, the most stress going through the body one of the one of the really good things about the oep system is is that it is dealing with numbers and i think athletes and coaches like to see numbers and so you can sort of give them that information about it's not just a kind of video where you have to sort of interpret it a little bit subjectively with the oep system you can actually see that somebody's kind of got 10 percent better in terms of you know their volume or you know that that their synchronicity has come back into phase or as or as at least moved moved back towards being in phase so you do get that kind of um that quantitative improvement and as john said you can give them this uh sort of real-time feedback display so they can see it changing as you're working with them and kind of trying out different visualizations and, and that type of thing um and the really good thing about um you know, a sort of motion capture based system is that you're not tied to a particular spot and people can, you can be assessing people actually while they're exercising. So it's not the case that, for example, with the sort of traditional spirometry system, you actually have to kind of stop them while they do it and they perform a, a particular um, sort of test technique. You're actually testing them, you know, while they're on the treadmill running or while they're on the bike um, cycling. Um, and, I, and I think the kind of additional insights that you gain from that are really valuable. Yeah, and, I mean, and just 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 go on to that num number thing. One of the reasons why I'm really excited about it is I, I've been helping athletes overcome breathing problems like this for 20 years, but I've never had anything really objective to say we've taken you from A to B. And so, for example, sometimes it's been quite hard to get sports sports medics supporting the athlete or, or or physiotherapists supporting the athlete to really buy into doing it because we haven't got any numbers to go yes we've improved them by 10 20 percent and their breathing pattern has changed um and so that 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 is going to be long term that's really really crucial and really big step change in what we can what we can kind of offer offer the athlete and their support team and john i think you touched upon there that i mean we talked a lot here about athletes but i think you touched upon general population a little bit when you when you said you could have somebody on there for you know 30 seconds who could then run for for a minute mm -hmm. obviously in the current climate with with covid19 um and breathing have we got any information about you know how breathing's being affected with covid and if any of this could could actually help anybody yeah i mean i think i think some of the, and again there's there's always a few issues with that actual actual diagnosis of dysfunctional breathing in the general population because again a lot of it's made on uh, reports on symptoms maybe questionnaires and again obviously there's there's issues around that but what i probably say generally is there's certainly a group of individuals that maybe you might classify them post-covid or you call them long covid or whatever you want to call them but they are reporting uh, more breathlessness on exertion than maybe they would they did before um before they had they had uh, covid infection now why that is 
it, there, there potentially there potentially are a few reasons for it. Some of it might be that there might be compromise that their, their um, ability to diffuse oxygen acro- across into um, into their body might be a little bit compromised now. Um, we're pretty sure that COVID there's no there's there's not particularly strong evidence from what I've seen that COVID has affected lung function in terms of the the volume of air that people can move and the speed it moves in and out of the airways. But if you're what COVID can do is Potentially, I guess I try and liken it to it's a bit like having a sprained ankle and you might change your walking gait to walk around your sprained ankle. And you might change your breathing pattern to breathe around kind of your COVID infection, if you like. And sometimes if you've had a quite quite severe case of COVID or or you've had that kind of issue, there might be something in the back of your kind of psyche that says, you know what, I just don't want to breathe how I I used to breathe. And they might, or you might want to control it a little bit more. And if you try and over control your breathing pattern, you can develop dysfunctional breathing patterns quite easily. And so we might see, well, we we know that there's more people reporting symptoms post COVID. And a lot of those, we don't know because we, we haven't been able to put many people through tests like OEP we don't know whether whether they've kind of had this kind of chronic change in their breathing pattern or whether it's something a bit more um sort of kind of of, uh, physiologically based it's actually something's changed within their within their lung function but I I, you know I've seen people maybe in different situations I've seen people have a bad chest infection and then develop a dysfunctional breathing pattern after having a, di- a bad chest infection for a long, for a long, for a long, for a prolonged period of time, and it might be something similar going on with COVID as well. But again, that's really exciting using this kind of OEP um, system, and probably one of the other things that that the OEP is, and we probably haven't really really touched on it. I mean, it, it's a, it's an assessment that can be done at distance. So once you've got all the marks on the individual, you can kind of step right back and let them kind of do all the deep breathing or all the exercise you like. Whereas do, using spirometry which is traditionally done or using even breath by breath analysis that might be done on a cardiopulmonary exercise test, they're probably a little bit higher risk in terms of um, kind of uh, transmission of COVID and things, whereas the, the OEP does allow assessments with people with maybe quite recently after having a COVID infection things because it's a little bit less invasive and it's a little bit, it's a, an assessment can be done a bit more at distance. Yeah, there's, no, there's no tubes kind of collecting <laughs> anything that you then have to clear up afterwards. <laughs> disinfect yeah nobody nobody likes taking the thing out your mouth <laughs> after a vo2 max test or oh, everywhere <laughs> we've all been there i'm sure um so sam i know that you've been doing some research obviously moving on a little bit from covid we're all wearing face masks now and and, and i think we've been doing some research at, at loughborough could you just enlighten us a little bit on that please <laughs> Yeah, so as as John said, um, potentially one of the issues, although we really don't know with the sort of long COVID and the breathlessness, is that there might be something at the back of the mind that's changing the breathing pattern. Um, uh, And one of the things that we're looking at is um, whether or not that might happen with mask use. So um, when the... Uh, it's, it's a little bit different now. I mean, we're sort of recording this on the day that everything is sort of starting to open back up. Um, but when the infection rates were really, really high before, and also remembering that other countries still have very high infection rates, and also that this might not be our kind of, you know, last respiratory pandemic that we experience in our lifetimes, although fingers crossed. Um, one of the things that we were... Um, that people have suggested is that when you're exercising outdoors, um, it, as you're breathing more heavily, you're more likely to kind of aer- aerosolize more and um, potentially spread COVID um, to people even though you're outside because of the increased um, sort of breathing that you're doing. Um, so one of the suggestions has been potentially people should try wearing masks when they're doing exercise outside if they're in a very um, populated area so that they don't spread COVID around. Now, that that's pretty unpopular. I mean, people, people feel as though it's uncomfortable to wear a mask when they're um, breathing heavily during exercise. Um, and we wondered why that might be. And obviously, one of the one of the key questions is, is it because 
um, potentially their breathing pattern changes with the mask use, potentially because because they're sort of panicking or whatever, because they've got some anxiety because they've got this mask across their face. And is it more the anxiety or the expectation of discomfort that's then changing their breathing pattern um, and that that change in breathing pattern perhaps because they become asynchronous or they become constricted in a certain part of their chest, that it's that change in breathing pattern that's causing people to feel uncomfortable when they're wearing a mask. Um, we know, for example, there's been a number of studies that have shown that if you run with a mask on, there's no change in your blood oxygenation. So they've shown that using these sort of pulse oximeters. Um, so, so we know that oxygen is getting through, but really we're trying to explain this discomfort. And if it is due to a change in the breathing, in, in the way that people are breathing in, in terms of the breathing patterns, then that means that we can use some of the techniques that John has talked about in terms of re-educating people with dysfunctional breathing um, to, to get them sort of breathing normally with a, with a mask. And that, that might be of use, use in the future. You know, if, in particularly in countries where infection rates might still be high, um, you know, or, or if we ever have to deal with this kind of situation again. Let's let, let let's hope not. <laughs> Yes, so correct. with with your guys research yeah definitely with your guys research kind of what what's next what's the future so we've we've seen almost an evolution really towards this oep kind of system that that you're now using um where, where's it going to next because you know having been around biomechanics a few years ago sticking all the little dots on people and things like that is there is there somewhere where this evolves to or what what are we looking forward to yeah yeah, uh, do, do, I'll, I'll I'll kick off right Sam, and then so, so, follow, so I mean, so in terms of what what, what what's next, it, uh, I mean I, I'm I I'm quite excited about it partly because the OEP itself is just actually kind of give us some really nice visualization of what what this functional breathing pattern is, and and so what we we just with the OEP we need to start getting a kind of substantial data set to allow us to kind of get what might be kind of cut off. Points so we can actually give use OEP to objectively kind of maybe diagnose a dysfunctional breathing pattern because at the moment we can kind of say well that's a little bit maybe away from the norm but we'd be nice to have some cut off um cut off from, from the OEP and we might be able to get them for various things so it might not be just dysfunctional breathing we can do it with you can pro potentially do it with asthma or with COPD and other respiratory problems um so that's kind of that's probably going to happen within the next year or two hopefully but long term what we really need to try and do is is try and pr produce something that makes the technology more accessible. So OEP itself, you need you need really skilled uh, practitioners like 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 Sam. Uh, you need a very expensive lab um, to to be able to do it. And you need time to analyze all the data, um, and so that practically isn't really going to be very accessible to to most people um, who maybe have a, have a have a breathing problem. So what we're trying to do is trying to look for methods that we can maybe that allow us to take measurements similar to OEP but allow us you know and that could be could be using cameras it could be using um skin based sensors could be all sorts of well, there's all sorts of options out there but if we can make something that is um more user friendly and accessible that means that your 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 asthma nurse or your your GP can can utilize that technology um to to diagnose a kind of a community kind of care level um, it means that more athletes around the, the world are going to get better um, real-time feedback on their breathing pattern when they're exercising to get a good indication whether it's asthma or whether it's dysfunctional breathing so that's where we really need to move it the difficulty is if it was that easy it would already be done so, so it's, it's it's a challenge but we, it's one of those things that we're really excited about because what it's going to involve is collaboration i mean myself and sam already collaborated from a kind of a exercise physiologist and a biomechanist and now we need now we need collaboration from uh, more in an in, in engineer environment to kind of sort of take you know to take it take it to that kind of level and um, so it's going to be a um uh kind of a nice interdisciplinary um research question to answer i think go, going forwards um but it's quite it's really exciting and hopefully we're going to be sat here in about 10 years time all, all knowing how we're breathing because we got like a little app on our phone and we can go oh, yeah i mean i've got a really good breathing pattern today um and that's kind of where we want to be that, that does sound really exciting um sam is there anything to add to that or 
Has he, has he hit the nail on the head with all that? Yeah, I think John's covered it. I mean, one of the things that we're looking at in particular is uh, around just being able to use sort of webcams or, or, or sort of smartphone cameras or that level of camera, you know, cheap, easily accessible, that type of thing. Um, as John says, not just the treatment in this country, but actually if you if you think about kind of the, the wider world that's out there, um, in perhaps countries, again, you know, where coronavirus infection rates are higher or where pot- potentially it's difficult to kind of transport a lot of medical equipment around. It might be difficult to transport spirometry kits and everything that's needed to disinfect them in the in the current climate around. If you could monitor somebody's breathing pattern and do things like, you know, diagnose whether it's asthma or dysfunctional breathing um, or to support somebody's breathing technique or their recovery from COVID or lots of other respiratory conditions um, in some of those countries around the world, that would be um, really hugely beneficial as, as well. So it's 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 kind of, you know, asthma is a global problem. Um, and I think a couple of years ago, it was one of, it was the World Health Organization, it was part of their sort of grand challenges. Rates of asthma are still sort of increasing around the world because of things like pollution and climate change and, and that type of thing. So in actual fact, um, respiratory monitoring and being able to do that cheaply and easily and, and getting a really good picture of somebody's complete breathing pattern technique has really wide um, applications and implications. Brilliant. So, I mean, just to just to finish off, really, um, obviously, we've heard a lot about breathing and I, and I promised people they would understand how we breathe after listening. I'm sure we've got some a lot of in-depth knowledge uh, from you guys. So thank you very much. But if anybody wanted to kind of move forward from listening to this and, you know, potentially use the systems you've been talking about, about or identify dysfunctional breathing or look at how to improve their technique is there any way you could direct them to to kind of find some more information on this yeah i run a couple of respiratory clinics myself so um at the university of kent we've got a respiratory clinic where people can kind of self-refer themselves to me and um, you've just simply looked up exercises respiratory clinic university of kent on on google or whatever then you'd probably like to find us i've also got a clinic out uh the cent- center of health and human performance uh, based in london in harley street so we we've, there are kind of clinics out there that that, that individuals can't can source and um, because it's not always the case that the kind of the gp or community care practice has that kind of specialized specialization in exercise and spiritual problems i'm sure me, me and sam are quite happy for our emails to be kind of kind, kind of out there people i'm quite happy to answer them I've also just edited a book. Um, if people want to um, want a bit more interest, they can always um, look up the complete guide to respiratory care in athletes. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's more, it's more for the practitioner working with with an athlete, but it certainly gives you a really good insight into all the respiratory problems that athletes might, might face. Brilliant! Yeah. That is exactly the kind of resource we're talking about. Sam, have you got anything to add? Oh. Yeah, um, we're also sort of setting up studies um, and, and testing at Loughborough as well, you know, with John's support. And we actually have a PhD position starting very soon, um, which will continue looking at um, using OEP to diagnose and retrain. Um, so we'll we'll be looking for participants um, in the local area as well for those all of those studies that will be starting fairly soon. Perfect. Well, it's been great talking to you both. Thanks very much for coming on and thanks for giving us an insight into respiratory physiology and, and breathing. So thanks a lot. We'll I'll speak to you again soon. A pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Loughborough Sportcast. If you want to get in touch and let us know any subject areas or experts that you'd be keen to listen to, then contact me, Martin Foster, on m.foster at alborough.ac.uk or tweet me at martinfoster82. Bye for now. We'll see you next time.